Welcome back to CCCS 122, Discrete Mathematics, Chapter 5. And we're continuing with mathematical induction. So the principle of mathematical induction, uh, it's very useful. Uh, it's a tool for proving uh, predicates and uh, that are true for all natural numbers. Now, it cannot, induction cannot be used to discover theorems, but uh, we can use it as a tool to prove them. And you can think of the method of uh, mathematical induction as somewhat similar to dominoes. And I don't mean the pizza chain. I mean this thing over here. Now, let me switch over and show you what this video is actually about in the uh, in the slides that I've uploaded. You can, uh, if you open this on, on a desktop PC, you can just click on the picture and it'll play the video for you. And the party. So you saw that is uh, uh, this is uh, this was a really large, comically large set of dominoes, and uh, saw that uh, from the beginning the basic idea was basically that uh, if you drop the small smallest domino block in the beginning, that is able to drop a slightly larger block following it which in turn, in turn drops a slightly larger block and so on until you can drop the largest block that is that you have at the at the end of that uh, series of blocks so uh, the dropping the first domino is in 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 induction it's it's called it's basically called the basis step it's like solving the simplest form of a problem uh, now then proving the inductive step is like showing that if you can drop one do domino, you can drop the next one, not any other, just the next one. And if you take these two pieces together, what it basically means is that if you can prove that the first domino falls, then due to the inductive, st the logic of the inductive step, the second one will fall as well. And if the second one will fall, that will drop the third one. And if the third one falls, that will drop the fourth one, and so on until infinity. Now, in uh, 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 we've, we've been dealing with predicates or propositional functions of this form uh, before. And uh, that's what we'll be dealing with again while studying induction. Uh, so the way to, to to the way we move ahead is we basically show that we begin by showing that p of zero is true, and that becomes the basis step. And following that, we assume that if the propositional function p of n is true then that will automatically that will uh, that will in turn mean that p of n plus 1 is also true and that is that inductive step and taking these two together basically means that p of n is true for any natural number and that's the conclusion and so this is this uh, there's a, induction has this three-step process that you see over here. And here's a very simple example. So show that n is less than 2 to the power n for all positive integers n. Now, uh, let uh, the propositional function p of n 
let that be n is less than 2 to the power n. Then we begin with the basis step, show that this proposition uh, function is true for the, ba the, the simplest case, meaning p of 1. And of course, you can just put n equal to 1 in here and check, and you get 1 on the left side, 2 to the power 1, or 2 on the other side, and of course, 1 is less than 2. So um, we've proven it, we've, we've, we've proven the basis step. And we move on to the inductive step. And let's see, we have over here p of n, and we assume now that p of n is true. And with that assumption, we will prove that p of n plus 1 is also true. And we assume that, that means that we assume that n is less than 2 to the power n it is true. Now, based on that assumption, using that assumption, we need to show that p of n plus 1 is true, meaning n plus 1 is less than 2 to the power n plus 1. And we begin again with n less than 2 to the power n less than 2 to the power n. And what we do is we add 1 to both sides. And of course, we can make this a less than equal to sign, and we can replace one by something larger, which we do. We replace one by two to the power n. When we do that, we can rewrite this thing over here as two times two to the power n, which can be rewritten as two to the power n plus one. And this is what we set out to prove. And so therefore, if we assume that n is less than 2 to the power n, if that is true, then we can prove that n plus 1 is less than 2 to the power n plus 1. Since we've already proven the basis step, this means we can conclude that n is less than 2 to the power n is true for any positive integer, and that's the end of the proof. Here's another example. So we have this uh, uh, Gaussian summation over here. So one, so we're adding up uh, integers from one to n, and the corresponding formula for that is this one over here. So let's prove that this is actually correct. Uh, using induction. So let's begin with the basis step. So for n equal to 0, we get on the left hand side, we get 0. On the right hand side, we get what? 0 times anything is also 0. So we get 0 on the other side as well. Now, assuming that p of n is true, p of n now being basically being this formula over here. Assuming that p of n is true, then let's prove that p of n plus 1 is also true. That, that'll be the inductive steps. So we begin with uh, the general expression p of n. And what we now do now is we add n plus 1 on both sides. So we got this already in the form we need it to be in and now we need to do we need to modify we need to modify what we have here on the right hand side and what we can do is we can take n plus one as a common factor out of the, both these terms we've got n plus one over here and we've got n plus one over here we do that and rewrite that like so and then we can rewrite these two terms with two as the common denominator. Do that and you get n plus one times n plus two divided by two. And then you just have these two terms being multiplied. And as you can see, 
uh, get thing over here. Now we can only rewrite this slightly. And just to make it more explicit of what's happening over here, we can rewrite it like this. So we've got on this side, the sum of a sequence of integers from uh, zero to n plus one. And on the other side, we have the last integer, n plus one, times the last integer plus one. So basically the same formula that we had over here, but with n replaced with n plus one. So assuming this equation over here is true, then this propositional function, it seems, can be proven uh, to also be true for the case n plus one. Having proven the inductive step, that lets us conclude that this propositional function is true for all n that are real numbers of the set of real numbers. And that's the end of the proof. Now, there's another proof technique that is very similar to mathematical induction that is uh, called the second principle of mathematical induction, or also known as strong induction. And uh, this can be used to prove that a propositional function p of n is true for any natural number n. So kind of very similar to the induction that we just used. And uh, uh, these are the three steps of strong induction. So you show that the basis step, step, basis step is just like before. We show that uh, the simplest case of the problem, uh, uh, that the propositional function holds for the simplest case, p0. And then you assume that the propositional function holds for not only for p of n, but for all smaller instances, meaning for p0, and for p1 and for p2 p3 all the way for all the cases up to p of n and using that assumption you then prove that the proposition function also holds for p for, for the case n plus one again uh, taking the basis step and the inductive step together lets us conclude that p of n must hold for any n that is a set uh, that is an element of the set of natural numbers okay here's another example show that every integer greater than one can be written as the product of primes so the big what is the smallest uh, case for this problem is two so show that p of 2 is true. And uh, of course, 2 is the product of only one prime itself. So the basis step is proven. The basis step may seem trivial, but it is necessary. It is basically the uh, foundational logic on which uh, the inductive step stands. Now, show that if p of 2 and p of 3 and all the way up to p of n, uh, if, if, if the proposition function uh, holds for all of these, then uh, p of n plus 1 is also true. That will be the inductive step. So we have two possible cases. If n plus 1 is a prime number, then obviously p of n plus 1 is already true, kind of like for the case of p of 2. Remember, 2 is a prime number. Um, however, if n plus 1 is a composite number, it can be written as a product of at least two integers. Let's call them a and b. And a and b will be anywhere from including 2 up to any number less than n plus 1. And by the induction hypothesis, both A and B can be written as the product of primes. So because A and B are less than n plus 1, and we have already assumed that uh, the proposition holds for smaller cases of the problem, means that 
A and B can already be written as the product of primes. And so if n plus 1 can be written as A times B, then that means we're, we're done with the inductive step. That lets us get the conclusion, meaning that P of n must be true for any n that is an element of the set of natural numbers. And that gets us to the next section of this chapter, recursion. A recursion is a principle that's related to mathematical induction. And I think you must already be familiar with the idea of recursion from uh, an, at least at one earlier course. So uh, in a re recursive definition, an object is defined in terms of itself. Uh, and we can uh, recursively define sequences, functions, and sets. So uh, the sequence an of powers of, or powers of 2 is given like this. That's one way to define it. Uh, it's one way to define that sequence. Um, but we can also define the sequence recursively. And uh, the first element in that sequence is a0, which is simply equal to 1. So that's kind of like the, the simplest case, again, like the basis step in induction. And uh, any element, n pl the n plus 1th element in the sequence can be defined in terms of the previous element a n in the sequence, simply like this, two times the previous element in the sequence. This is a different definition from the definition we have up here. This definition over here explains, defines the next element in the sequence in terms of the previous element of the sequence. And that previous element in the sequence can in turn be defined in terms of the element coming right before that one, all taking you all the way back to the first element in the sequence, which is a0, and which is specified very un unambiguously in, in the form of value, in this case, 1. You can very easily see the connection, the relationship between induction and recursion and how the, the similarity of principles between the two in this example. Now, uh, we can use this method to define a uh, function uh, with natural numbers as its domain. So uh, specify the value of the function at zero, like we just did, the zeroth element of that sequence. and can follow and you have to follow that up with giving a rule for finding uh, its value at any integer uh, from the values for a smaller integer. So we did we gave the definition of a n plus one in terms of the element a n previous element. Such definitions are called recursive or even inductive definitions. And here's another example. So we have f0 equal to 3. So this is, like again, the base case. And uh, the n plus 1th element is 2 times the value of the function at n plus 3. What does that mean? First element is 3 as given. Then f1 is simply 2 times f at 1 less than 1, meaning at f0 plus 3. And we have the value at f0. Just substitute that over here and we get 2 times 3 plus 3 equal to 9. And then f2 can be found similarly f2 is 2 times f1 plus 3. 
I can just substitute the value of f1 in here, which gives me 2 times 9 plus 3 equal to 21. And f3 done similarly, 45. And f4 is defined similarly, gives me 93. How can we recursively define the factorial function? The factorial function, if you recall, is this one. So the base case over here is factorial of 0, which is, we know, factorial of 0 is 1. And then the factorial value of any value n plus 1 simply can be defined recursively as n plus 1 times the factorial of n. If we do the same, apply the same treatment to this example, so factorial of 0 is 1, factorial of 1 is 1 times the factorial of 0, which gives me 1, the factorial of 2 is 2 times the factorial of 1, which is 2 times 1, 2, the factorial of 3 is 3 times the factorial of 2. 3 times 2 is 6. And the factorial of 4 is 4 times the factorial of 3, meaning 4 times 6, 24, and so on. Another famous example that you've probably seen already is the sequence of Fibonacci numbers. The sequence of Fibonacci numbers begins with 0 and 1. And the nth element in the Fibonacci series is defined as the sum of the previous two elements, the n minus 1 and the n minus 2 elements. So we're given that f0 is 0 and f1 is 1, so we know we're given the first two elements of the Fibonacci series. Given this recursive inductive definition, we can find f2. f2 is simply f1 plus f0, or 1 plus 0, or 1. And f3 is simply f2 plus f1, which is 1 plus 1, or 2. f4 is f3 plus f2 or 2 plus 1, 3. f5 is f4 plus f3, uh, f3, which is sum of the last two numbers in the sequence, 3 plus 2 equal to 5. And f6 is equal to f5 plus f4, sum of the last two elements in the sequence, meaning 5 plus 3 equal to 8. Now, if we want to define, recursively define a set, we need to provide two things, an initial set of elements and rules for the construction of additional elements from elements that are already in the set. And here's a simple example. Let S be a set that is recursively defined by 3 is an element of S. And X plus Y is an, also an element of S if X is an element of S and Y is an element of S. In here, S is basically the set of positive integers divisible by 3. And here's the proof. And we do the proof, this proof, we do it in two parts. So let's have a set A of all positive integers that are divisible by 3. And we want to show that S is basically the set of 
all positive integers divisible by 3, meaning that a is equal to s. To prove that two sets are equal, you can do that in two parts. You can prove that first that a is a subset of s and s is a subset of a. If both are true, it means a is equal to s. So for part one, we'll prove the first of these. We'll prove that a is a subset of s. Uh, and for that, we must show that every positive integer divisible by 3 is in s. And we will use mathematical induction to prove this. So let p of n be the statement that 3n belongs to s. The basis step is p1 is true because 3 is in s. Inductive step is to show that if p of n is true, then p of n plus 1 is also true. Now let's assume that 3n is in s. Now since 3n is in s and 3 is also in s, it follows from uh, this recursive definition of s that 3n plus 3, which can be rewritten as 3 times n plus 1, is also in s. And that lets us conclude that A is a subset of S. For part two, we have to prove that S is a subset of A. The basis step, again, we'll, do, we'll use induction, is to show that all initial elements of S are in A. Now, 3 is in A. That's, that's true, so basis step is done. For the inductive step, we have to show that x plus y is in A whenever x and y are also in A. Now, if x and y are both in A, that means that 3 divides x and 3 also divides y. And we already know that from, we already know that if 3 divides x and 3 divides y, then that means that 3 also divides x plus y. And that concludes the inductive step, which lets us conclude that s is a subset of a, and combining parts 1 and parts 2, that means that a is equal to s. Another example. Um, so uh, well-formed formulas of variables, numerals, and operators like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and exponent are defined by um, x is a well-formed formula if x is a numeral or variable. And uh, I've got a bunch of functions over here. So uh, f plus g, f minus g, f times g, f divided by g, f to the power g are all well-formed formulas if f and g are as well. And a well-formed formula is a, is a definition, uh, or nothing, nothing difficult, nothing fancy. It means, uh, so in, in logic, propositional logic, predict logic, a well-formed formula, uh, uh, often just a simple formula, is a, f is a finite sequence of symbols from a given alphabet that is part of a formal language. The formula, basically, well-formed formula is really just, if you want to think about it, uh, means just a specific formula. And uh, we've got uh, some well-formed formulas like that over here, we have some examples. And uh, uh, an algorithm uh, it's called recursive if it solves a problem by reducing the problem to an instance of the same problem but smaller input. One example of that is the recursive Euclidean algorithm. That's the pseudocode for that. Another one is 
the recursive Fibonacci algorithm. So pseudocode for that. Again, these are um, uh, uh, at least the Fibonacci algorithm. This is an example uh, that you've probably done in your introductory programming course, CCCS 111. And the way it works, the way the recursive version of uh, the, the way the recursive version works is, uh, you want to find the fourth element in the Fibonacci uh, sequence, and find that by find calling the same function to that and, and calling another instance of this function that gets you the third and the second uh, Fibonacci numbers in the sequence. And you get the third Fibonacci uh, number by calling the function, f another instance of this function for, uh, for argument two. And you get the, that number by calling the function again for Fibonacci one. And once you get a return value from this function, you call the function again with, for Fibonacci for the zeroth Fibonacci number, you get a return value. These are the base cases, remember. The return value you get over here is zero. The return value you get over here is one. That lets you get one plus zero, one over here, which is returned up the tree to F3. Now F3 is not done. It also needs F1. And that's another base case value is 1, so we send back value 1 over here, so 1 plus 1 is 2, which is sent back to f4, and f4 still needs the value of f2, f2 will need, will again call, same function call for the Fibonacci number of 1, which is a base case as a value one, so one tra travels back, is returned back up, and the other one is a zero, which travels back up. You have the Fibonacci number one over here, one plus zero, one, which goes back, is returned up to the original calling function F4, which then is able to, has both the numbers it needs, adds them up, and gets three. So as you can see, um, yeah, elegant, but look clearly a lot of overhead. Um, this is also pseudocode that gets you uh, the Fibonacci sequence, but without using recursion. And this is important to remember that any algorithm that can be defined as a recursive algorithm always has an equivalent uh, iterative algorithm. The thing is though that recursive algorithms are often shorter, and more elegant, and easier to understand than their iterative counterparts. However, iterative algorithms are usually, usually more efficient in terms of both space and time. And you just saw how in the recursive algorithm for the Fibonacci sequence, uh, it involved many function calls. And that will usually not be the case in iterative versions of corresponding algorithms, of corresponding recursive algorithms. And that gets us to the end of chapter five.